But uh, anyway, if, if you guys want me to teach visual uh, scanning and collision avoidance, it'll be a great exercise in how well I BS, which I'm completely <laughs> uh, willing to do. I think it'd be entertaining. Uh, I, I, I never even finished writing the lesson, um, but it would be, uh, I'm, I'm totally willing to try it. <laughs> You have the PTS in front of you. I, I've got the yeah. I've got <laughs> so I, I've got the start of a lesson, um, which has the PTS uh, requirements in it, um, and I've got kind of ice flags written down. <laughs> oh, we got we got a Jason Shepard boy over here. Uh, yeah, I, I, I got ice flags. I, I hate Jason Shepard, <laughs> but that's where I got it from. Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, I I, I can teach. Uh, you guys want me to? Yes, please. Yes, I'm I'm a willing participant. <laughs> cool. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So, uh, so, so visual scanning and collision avoidance. Um, obviously, this is an important area that the FAA um, emphasizes because though the sky is very, very big, and we we have this idea that you know. The, the sky does have kind of almost infinite places to put relatively small airplanes. The reality is, is that airplanes still have a tendency to fly at similar altitudes and in similar areas. And especially as we're out um, being pilots in, in practice areas where we're, you know, students and, and teachers alike may be distracted um, uh, going through various altitudes and doing various maneuvers, the reality is that there is a very decent likelihood that two airplanes get put on a collision course with each other in visual meteorological conditions, so not in the clouds, not in fog, and end up hitting each other. So there are great examples of this, um, and by great, I mean horribly tragic um, examples of this. Uh, one great example is, um, is the PSA crash in San Diego, uh, where you know, there's a, uh, a Cessna pilot out uh, flying around that collides with a, a commercial airliner. Um, visual conditions, uh, the two aircraft thought that they had each other, maybe a miscommunication with ATC, um, and end up hitting each other. Uh, I think a, an even more tragic, more recent example is in um, Compton, California, very busy airspace, Los Angeles, California. Um, sure you guys are all familiar with this accident. One GA airplane uh, talking on the radio. Compton is an uncontrolled airport. Uh, goes to land on a runway. Uh, talking on the, uh, you know, talking to everybody, telling everybody what's going on. Um, lands on the runway, and a warbird comes in, not talking on the radio, landing into the sun. Um, and uh, the warbird pilot didn't see the the Cessna landed on top of them, ended up killing uh, one of the passengers of of the Cessna, and the other one was injured um, horribly. Um, and I might have that wrong. It might be both people died. So don't quote me on that. I'm spouting this off the top of my head. Um, th there are countless examples. Um, I, I could go on YouTube and find five examples of where airplanes hit each other in midair. Um, so while we might think that this is uh, rare, um, it's, it's not. And that's why we need to pay attention. Um, as we are private pilot students, um, we need to recognize that we always have a responsibility to be continually looking out, continually scanning, and continually avoiding other aircraft. The responsibility is on you and me, and if we're flying against a student and teacher, both of us need to be looking outside and making sure that we're not gonna hit anybody. It's very, very important. So um, what we're gonna talk about here is, is some of the understanding, some of the ways that we can get distracted, some of the illusions that, that our brain and our eye might, uh, might, uh, might see, some of the things that prevent us from, from hitting other aircraft, and, and things to look out for, proper uh, techniques to really make sure that we are scanning and seeing and avoiding other aircraft to prevent a, um, a fatality in midair. So that's what we're going to be talking about here. Um, so jumping right in. Um, so first of all, um, as, as you might 
no already. Uh, when you go get a pilot's license, part of the uh, requirements is to get a medical. To get that medical, you have to have pretty good vision or it has to be correctable. Why? Well, again, I just went over it. We need to be able to see. But a 2020 eyesight is not the only thing that's a prerequisite for being able to see outside. There are other things that, that may prevent a pilot from being able to uh, see as well as they normally could. So eyes, to function well, need rest. You need to be sleeping. Um, they need oxygen. Um, so in, in separate lessons, um, we will have went through uh, kind of the I'm safe checklist. We will have went through um, hypoxia. Um, so I won't do that here, but suffice it to say, if it's dark outside and you're at high altitudes, your eyes start playing tricks on you. They don't see as well as they would if you're in low altitudes or breathing oxygen. So one of the first, uh, and, and again, we won't go deep into hypoxia here, but it's important to note that one of the first signs of hypoxia is degraded eyesight, is vision impairment. So it's very, very important to realize that if we're to be seen and avoiding as a visual flight rules pilot, um, we have to uh, have proper oxygen. Um, very, very important. Eyes are also impacted by drugs, by alcohol, by kind of overall health. Um, there's studies that show that they're affected by stress. Um, so it's, it's I, I guess this all underlines why it's so important to, as part of kind of the PAVE checklist and assessing you, the pilot, prior to flying, are you, the pilot, um, in a condition that, that is really prepared to fly? How are you doing that on that I'm safe checklist? Do you have illness? Do you have allergies? Is, are your eyes scratchy, right? Are you on medicine, et cetera? Um, very, very important to consider. Um, so with that said, um, uh, what are some conditions or what are, what are some um, um, uh, illusions that might prevent you from being able to uh, scan for other aircraft, to be able to uh, see and avoid? And, and there are several that, that we need to be aware of. Um, so first of all, how about um, some some um, environmental considerations. So obviously haze, fog, greatly inhibits a, a pilot's ability to see. I think um, I talked about this in the weather lesson, but um, you know, we, we're so accustomed to on a METAR hearing 10 statute miles of visibility and we go, we look outside and we go, yeah, visibility is great. You get up in the air, man, visibility is great. Well, the problem is, is that 10 statute miles of visibility may actually be 30. And we are accustomed to hearing 10 statute miles, looking outside, being able to see Oceanside from Mount Soledad and going, oh yeah, that's what 10 statute miles is. Well, the first time that we see eight statute miles of visibility, I think it's a wake-up call to us pilots in realizing that eight miles of visibility is actually really crappy visibility, and it makes it really hard to see other aircraft that are flying around. I think one of the most treacherous conditions to seeing and avoiding other aircraft is a, a foggy, hazy day against a white sky. Most airplanes are predominantly white, makes it really, really hard to see. This is, this should be like, you know, no duh. Like the, this type of stuff is um, what makes it hard to see other aircraft. But it's important to really underline this and, and remind um, us as pilots that on foggy, hazy days, we don't need to just be concerned with mountainous terrain and getting the airplane on the ground on a runway. We also need to be very concerned with other aircraft against that haze. Um, obviously, you know, dust storms, we don't have a whole ton of that here. Volcanic ash, um, things like sunrise and sunset against a dirty windscreen or a scratched up windscreen. Um, I don't know how many times you guys have landed at Montgomery with a dirty or a scratched up windscreen. Um, there are definitely planes in the fleet that I think twice about flying at sunset, landing in the sun, makes it really, really hard to see um, aircraft as you're, as you're approaching into the sun. So realizing that environmental considerations like that can greatly impair vision is um, again, it, it should be obvious, but I think we have a tendency to forget that. And it's, it's really important to remember. 
with that said, so outside of the environmental considerations, how about some of the, the, the illusions that we may see as humans? Uh, we're, we're imperfect at uh, interpreting the information that comes into our eyeballs. What do I mean by that? So there's, there's a series of uh, vestibular and visual illusions um, that, uh, that we need to be aware of as pilots. Um, several of them, I'm not going to go through all of them for sake of brevity, but several of them that I want um, us as pilots to be aware of is runway slow. Um, so we, we see this often, we see this at Catalina, an upsloping runway. So if you're landing on a lower area of the runway that then slows, slopes up, your aircraft appears to be higher and that results in a low approach to that runway. And the, the inverse true for a downsloping runway. You appear to be lower and it results in a higher approach. I, I had that happen to me uh, my first time going into Catalina and I ended up uh, having to go uh, for an abrupt go around because of that. Um, similarly, similar is the runway width. If you have a really, really wide runway, it looks like your approach um, is low versus if you have a very narrow runway, your approach looks high. If you're so used to coming into Montgomery Field with the, with the runway width, at Montgomery Field, um, and then all of a sudden you go to the March uh, Air Force Base, or you go to Harris Ranch with a very, very narrow runway, all of a sudden the sight picture is off. So again, that, that wide runway, you look like your approach is really, really low, and so you have to be able to correct for that as a pilot. Um, haze, we, we talked about haze um, on, on how it just makes other aircraft uh, hard to see. Well, also with, with terrain, with mountains, with air, uh, airports, haze makes objects in the distance look farther away than they actually are. And, and we see this um, oftentimes um, in San Diego on really stable atmospheric days where you take off on a right downwind and you look out to Coles Mountain and you know how far Coles Mountain is away, but all of a sudden it looks like it's like 10, 15 miles away. Haze makes stuff look a lot further away than, than it actually is. Um, some more of these, false horizon. Um, so as you're out flying around, um, if, if you're over uh, the ocean, for instance, and maybe you've got some clouds or it's a, um, a moonless sky, oftentimes the water bleeds into the horizon, bleeds into the sky, and you, you don't know where the horizon is, or you're out flying over the grapevine, and you've got a bunch of lights um, on the horizon, um, and, and it's very hard to distinguish where that horizon is, um, can be really, really disorienting. Um, and, and the moment that we lose sight with, of the horizon, you kind of, your body instantly starts questioning what it's doing. As you become, hopefully, once you get your private pilot's license and you become an IFR pilot or you become an IFR student, you pick up on a lot of these. You go into clouds straight and level, 20 seconds into a cloud, you will be turning. Why? Well, because the body is very, very susceptible to, um, to not being able to pick up on, on, on cues or, or our, our ears and our eyes can often lie to us. So it's really important to realize um, that, that we do, that the human body does have that kind of um, um, susceptibility. Uh, another great example that we do have in uh, California is featureless terrain. So this kind of black hole effect where if you're flying around and you've got a bunch of lights on the ground, but all of a sudden there's an area that has absolutely no lights. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult as a pilot to figure out kind of what's going on. You can get disoriented. The aircraft appears that it's a lot higher than it actually is, can result in a really low approach. Are you getting low? Um, I had this happen to me as I was getting really, really close to uh, being check ride ready. Um, my CFI, um, we went out flying on, on, on a mock check ride, and uh, he kind of put me through a, 
uh, increased rigor than a normal private pilot student. Um, and we did a no landing light uh, approach to landing. And I thought I was fine, right? I, I had the nav lights going, I had the strobes going and they were kind of flashing off the runway and I thought I was good. I ended up putting that nose wheel into the ground. I thought I was a lot higher than I actually was. Um, so it, it, again, if you, if you have a black hole, kind of the featureless terrain, um, no lights, uh, results in you being a lot lower than you think you are. There's this concept of autokinesis. Uh, so this is an interesting one. At night, you've got lights. Um, if you stare at a light for long enough, for more than like 30 seconds, your, your brain plays a trick on you. Your eyes play a trick on you. You start seeing those lights move. It appears that those lights are all of a sudden moving. And we, as pilots, might interpret those to be other aircraft, when in fact, it's a light that we've been staring at on the ground, um, and all of a sudden it starts to move. Um, so how can we avoid autokinesis is, is a great question. And, and really, we need to prevent that uh, by number one, understanding it, but number two, using our peripheral vision and not staring at any one thing. And, and I'll get into that more in a minute on, on you know, okay, if, if this is all the bad stuff, how do you actually, um, how do you do the good stuff? How do you, how do you properly scan? Um, let's see, what else? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at, at that. There, there are more visual illusions. I mentioned ice flags at the beginning is a, is a great uh, acronym to understand all of the vestibular illusions. Um, but be, because of time, I do want to get into some other concepts here. Uh, so with all of that said, um, how do we properly um, look out for other airplanes? It's unfortunately not as easy as, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm looking outside and I don't see any aircraft. Um, so I think, first of all, it's, it's important to understand that we have a responsibility, as I mentioned at the beginning, to see and avoid other aircraft. Um, it is not the responsibility of ATC as, as visual pilots under visual meteorological conditions. It is not ATC's job, even if you're on flight following, to tell us where other aircraft are and to help us avoid other aircraft. On a workload permitting basis, ATC is absolutely a great idea to utilize, but they're not gonna always tell us about other aircraft. So we have a responsibility to always uh, be looking out. Um, we want to stay far away from aircraft, from other aircraft. A, um, the FAA actually uh, defines a near miss as any aircraft that come within 500 feet of each other. I don't know about you guys, but I don't wanna be anywhere near 500 feet from another aircraft unless I'm doing formation flight. Um, yeah, so um, wherever possible, um, uh, where, not wherever possible, uh, wherever uh, you um, see another, whenever you see another aircraft, regardless of the conditions, um, it's your responsibility to maneuver to avoid uh, that aircraft. Um, so how do we do this? Um, so let, let's talk about it in kind of two phases of flight, on the ground and in the air. Um, we, we have a separate lesson on runway incursion avoidance and uh, proper taxiing techniques, but I do want to touch it here because it is important to execute um, good visual scanning while you're on the ground. Um, so very briefly, as we're out taxiing around, we want to make sure our eyes, our eyes, not, a, not the brim of our cap, our eyes are outside, um, that we're looking out, that we're paying attention to outside. We're not inside. We're not programming the GPS. We're not looking at our route of flight. We're outside. Um, we want to make sure that we're on kind of a continuous loop of, of scanning. So we're coming up to a, an intersecting runway. We're looking left. We're verbalizing, we're, we're clear left, we're looking right, we're verbalizing, I'm turning right, we're clear ahead, I'm executing a complete sweep uh, 180 degrees. And then lastly, as, as we're taxiing down the center line and we're turning onto the runway, let's make sure that that runway is the runway that we were intended. Let's make sure that it says the runway that we were assigned. Let's make sure that it matches our magnetic heading. And then let's make sure that we're clearing final. We're actually turning the aircraft 
into final so we can see oncoming aircraft and we're not just kind of turning blindly down the runway like so many people do. How do we prevent Compton from happening, the Compton crash? By paying attention, by looking outside. Not that that was somebody taxiing onto the runway to take the runway, but it's those types of things. It's uh, a lot of times a pilot uh, we'll not look down final and make sure that final is clear. And those are very uh, easy, basic things that we need to bake into our routine every time we take a runway. All right, so you've now taken the runway, you've rotated, you're up in flight. How do we avoid hitting other aircraft? So first of all, as I talked about with autokinesis at night, you're staring at a light, it has a tendency to move. Well, it's also bad to fixate on any one area during the day in, in uh, proper daylight. Um, you want to be moving your eyeballs in, in small increments around the windscreen. Um, so the FAA says that we should be moving our eyeballs in 10 degree increments and staring at an area no longer than one, I like to say two seconds, um, but moving your eyeballs in, in succession of 10 degree increments across the windscreen. You don't wanna be fixating on any one area. Um, your peripheral vision is not great for identifying a specific object, but it is great for detecting motion. So being aware of your, of your peripheral vision um, and its ability to detect apparent motion, uh, another aircraft that's moving um, against a backdrop is kind of what that peripheral vision should be um, used for. And then I think it's really important to, to highlight the idea of integrated flight, uh, flight training. So this idea that instruments are great. And even as visual pilots, we should be absolutely scanning our attitude indicator, making sure that we're on heading. But this is like, you know, 10% inside the cockpit, 90% outside the cockpit. As we're doing things like turns around a point and you're making sure that, you know, okay, I'm on downwind right now. Okay, I'm turning, you know, crosswind. I'm now upwind. Okay, I wanna be rolling out on heading. Um, don't be staring at that heading indicator, right? We go inside, we check where we're at heading indicator, we check the altimeter, we're back outside, right? We're one second, two second inside. 10 seconds, 12 seconds outside. That's the idea of integrated um, uh, flight training. Um, and then it, it's important to maintain situal awareness. Um, so, you know, I mentioned the, the Compton crash, uh, uncontrolled airport. Did that warbird have to be talking to people? No, they didn't. There's no rule at an uncontrolled airport that says that, that all pilots must be on frequency. Um, but it's, it's important to, if people are talking, to be kind of visualizing where they are. As we're at uncontrolled airports, let's visualize when somebody says, you know, I'm on a left downwind for 2-8 uh, for left. Well, what does that mean? Where are they in relation to where I am? If I'm out uh, in Alpine flying at 3,500 feet um, doing steep turns or whatever, um, and somebody says, I'm at L cap, at uh, 4,500 feet and I'm southbound, well, well, where is that in relationship to me? And, and where are they gonna be in another minute, right? Realizing, painting this picture in our heads of where other people are, instead of just saying, oh, well, you know, I'm in Alpine at 3,500 feet, they're not in Alpine, I'm good to go. I think is really, really important. That's kind of this concept of, of, of situal aware, situational awareness and, and being kind of aware and forming a picture of, of where everybody is at any given time. Um, additionally, using, using technology is not a bad thing. So a lot of our aircraft have ADSB traffic on the GPS. Having that page up is, is a great tool. Uh, traffic on the iPad, great tool, but let's realize that, that, that not every aircraft is gonna be on ADS-B. Um, even in San Diego, not every aircraft is gonna appear on your technology as a traffic target. You've got military aircraft that may not be on ADS-B, and you have some old, old planes that are not mandated to be ADS-B compliant that are flying around in the pattern at Montgomery. So 
I don't want us as, as CFIs and as students to overly rely on ADSB. If I don't see a target, I must be okay. Situational awareness. Um, let's see. So, um, so when it comes to uh, being situationally aware and, and executing on proper um, um, visual scanning techniques, um, again, I, I've said this multiple times in this lesson, but um, I just, I think to when I was an early uh, time pilot and how much dependency I placed upon other people to tell me where, where they were in the sky, people to be using air to air, if I was on with the ATC, for ATC to tell me where other people were. Um, it's important to underline that, that your separation as a visual pilot is your responsibility. It is your responsibility to see and avoid other aircraft. You alone are responsible for your own safety. Really, really important uh, to underline. If you can't uh, see and avoid other aircraft, um, your chances of a mid-air collision are, are greatly increased, obviously. Your risk is dramatically increasing. Um, not clearing an area with a clearing turn um, is, uh, I mentioned earlier, being an alpine and, and doing maneuvers, it's very easy to get kind of complacent. And I'll, you know, I just did a couple steep, I've, I've now cleared the area 360 degrees. Why do I need to do a clearing turn before a chandel if you're a commercial pilot? Well, let's ask ourselves on that 360 degree turn, steep turn, uh, did we really, were, were our eyes outside that entire time? Were we scanning that entire time? Did we actually visually clear the entire area? Or should we actually do a clearing turn to the left before doing a chandelle to the left and kind of re-looking at everything to our left and making sure that it's clear? Um, pretty important. Um, I think realizing where high density traffic areas are, realizing where um, training areas are, you know, Alpine is very, very dense. Um, a VOR, over a VOR is usually pretty densely packed with traffic, people doing holds and instrument approaches. So realizing kind of where, obviously airports are very, very busy. Um, being situa situ situationally aware of, um, of these high traffic areas. And as you fly through these tra high traffic areas, just being on guard a little more is, um, is super important. So speaking of clearing turns, um, what is a clearing turn? Why is it important? Um, the idea of a clearing turn is before we're turning in any maneuver, a steep turn, a chandelle, a lazy eight, or whatever, before turning, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna clear the with, a, with a, a shallower turn, executing proper visual scanning techniques and verbalizing that we're clearing left. We're outside, if there are two pilots, we're encouraging uh, both pilots to be looking outside as we clear left, do 90 degrees, clear back to the right. We're looking outside, we're looking higher, we're looking lower, we're making sure that the whole is clear. Um, I, I said a 90 degree turn, I'd recommend a 180 degree turn. Clear that entire area, be looking, um, looking outside um, and making sure that we're not gonna hit anybody or anything. Um, I think a pre-maneuver checklist, I mentioned this in another lesson, but a pre-maneuver checklist is really, really important for this. Um, so I use Craig's, uh, but the idea of Craig's is um, before I do a maneuver, I'm clearing the area. I'm then making a radio call. You know, Alpine traffic, white and red Skyhawk, 4,500 feet, doing steep turns. Uh, Alpine traffic. So R for radio call. A, making sure that I'm at a proper altitude. Uh, G, gum. Uh, making sure that you know my fuel's on the proper tank. If I need carb heat on, it's on, etc. And then making sure that I have a safe place to land and I can get to that safe place to land. But the most important in this checklist um, is probably to clear the area, especially if you're in a practice area, especially if you're in a, a high density traffic area. Super important to be clearing the air. Um, and, and again, a pre-maneuver checklist will help you with that. Knowing your aircraft's blind spots. Um, all aircrafts have blind spots. Um, this is one 
early time pilot. It's just, you know, there are so many intricacies, so many things you have to be thinking about. Um, you know, a lot of us train in 172s, which are great because a lot of our maneuvers as a private pilot, uh, you have a greater tendency to lose altitude than you have to gain altitude. So our high wings allow us to look under us and make sure that that area under us is there. But I'd recommend um, that we're not just kind of wings level looking under us. As we do the clearing turn, as we're turning that 90 or 180 degrees, we're looking down under us. And then you look up toward the high wing that you've just raised and make sure that everybody, uh, that nobody is above you. Because in most circumstances, you're not able to see above that wing because that, that wing is obviously above you. In a lower wing plane, really, really critical because a lot of these maneuvers, if we're doing an emergency descent, guess where we're going? We're going down. So we need to not just clear the area around us at our altitude, we need to make sure there's nobody under us. So lowering that wing is super, super critical uh, to make sure that there's no traffic um, uh, below us. Um, Next thing that I'd, I'd mention um, in, the, in the list of, of, of things to keep top of mind is how quickly an airplane can, um, can be a collision hazard. So when I hear, so if I'm on with ATC and I'm flying down Victor 23 and ATC says opposite direction traffic five miles, Cessna you know, 172, Five miles away is really, really, really hard to see. Three miles away is really, really hard to see. Hard time seeing aircraft unless they're closer to three, than three miles away. But let's think about this. Um, if you are going 100 knots and you've got opposite direction traffic going 100 knots, um, the closure rate of that is you're talking about a minute. You're talking about a minute from three miles away to pitting each other. So you don't have much time at all to um, identify that traffic and to make a, an evasive maneuver if it's required. So super important to realize that three miles away does not mean that you're not going to have a conflict. And super important to realize that when you're head on, um, it poses a great challenge, not only because you're converging very, very quickly, but you've also got the phenomenon. Think about it for a second. If I'm going north and you've got an airplane going south, airplane has no relative motion to me versus if I've got an airplane that's off to the side of me that's moving one way or another, I can see that aircraft moving against the horizon or the terrain or the clouds in the background. If you're head on with an aircraft, that aircraft has no apparent motion to you. It's just a speck is moving toward you, maybe getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but not by much. So that's actually the greatest threat that we have, the greatest hazard that we have um, is head-on uh, collisions. Um, very, very uh, um, scary. Um, I think I hit everything in the PTS. <laughs> um, so uh, to, to wrap this up, um, this is a, a laundry list of, of, of topics, um, of things to realize as you're out flying as a visual pilot. Um, I don't expect you as a student to be able to remember all the, oh gosh, you know, I'm up, uh, you know, an Alpine. Chase gave me uh, 25 minutes worth of stuff to, uh, to remember to avoid hitting other aircraft. So let's distill this down into, into the most meaningful pieces. So first of all, use all available resources at your disposal. The idea of situational awareness. Use ATC, be on flight following. Um, if you're not, be on uh, whatever the, the common traffic or air-to-air or -air frequency is around you. Be making radio calls. Use your Garmin 430 650 that has traffic on it. Be on the traffic page or put traffic on the maps. Be aware of that. Use your iPad with ADSD. Um, use all of the disp all of the resources at your disposal. It's not a bad idea, but realize 
that all of those resources may fail. ATC may be preoccupied with IFR traffic and may not give you a traffic alert. Somebody may not be broadcasting their intentions on the radio. Um, you may have a non-ADSB equipped airplane flying around that might not be on your iPad. So it's your responsibility to be looking outside, scanning outside, 10 degree intervals. Is there anybody there? Look before turning, clear the area, pre-maneuver checklist every time you turn. Um, make yourself visible, keep your lights on. As you're flying around, a lot of our airplanes have LED lights. Um, you're not paying for them as a renter. Keep all of those lights on. Be as, as big and as bright as possible. Um, and, and then I, this might be a PTS area that I, that I neglected. Realize also, and, and this is something that we do have happening in, in uh, Southern California, realize that there is an order of operations to the right-of-way rules. Um, this should be evident, but if you are a, an airplane, you have to give way to a balloon. That's pretty obvious, I think. A balloon doesn't have maneuvering ability, and there are oftentimes balloons over kind of the Del Mar racetrack area or just south of there. Um, so if you're maneuvering, realize that you have to give way to a balloon. A glider has to give way to a balloon. An airship gives way to a glider. We give way to an airship, and then a helicopter ultimately has the most, uh, um, the, the highest ability to maneuver, thus they have to give way to, to an aircraft, but don't rely on that. Again, I'm, I'll close the lesson with this. It's your responsibility to see and avoid. If you've got an airplane ahead of you, or if you've got a helicopter ahead of you, should you expect them to take evasive uh, action because the helicopter, I wouldn't. I don't wanna hit them, I don't want them to hit me. It's your responsibility to see and avoid other aircraft. Any questions? That was a whole lot of bullshit. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it wasn't a bullshit because you covered, uh, he, here is the thing, you know, uh, me actually like, I got the point, okay? I, I got the point. And, and I think that's the most important thing in a lesson. Now, when it comes to the check ride, I would, I would take this. On, on the other hand, you know, like the, the, there are like some, some check ride items that, that I, I personally wouldn't want to go into like with a private pilot student. Uh, it's, it's very hard, you know, like for a student, you know, to, to, for example, vestibular illusions, lens, graveyard spins, so much of your, you know how, how much how much experience you know do they have and uh, you know like when i was thinking I, I wanted to say actually in this lesson that we as humans are two-dimensional right like we are moving on, on a solid surface pretty much like that's how we evolved we are not like fishes or birds that we have that third dimension that we can go actually up and yeah. down so you know like me you know i was i was you know like this is also like part of the lesson and i have to explain you know like vestibular illusion, you know, where you're entering the bank slowly and then your liquid stabilizes. it. Then it's kind of, uh, you, you know, like it's part of the lesson. I would personally be like, what liquid, you know, like maybe I, I would, uh, I would do that yeah. kind of, uh, what, how is it called? Mer Merry-go-round? How is it called where kids are kind of like, it's hard to explain, you know, like those kind of yeah. illusions, are, unless you, you have kind of like experiences with, with G forces, with acceleration. So, you know, like, you miss that and I'm okay with that. Because you know, like and we are dealing mostly, I actually spoke with a friend, he, he, he's a glider pilot. He actually does experience an elevator illusion. You know, he says when you're on a winch, uh, he says like that winch actually like really pushes you out, you know, like, so he says, actually, I do know how it feels. I, I said, like, yeah. honestly, like I never had a fast car in my life. So, you know, like other than the roller coaster, I can't really give you a good example, you know, like of, of, of that kind of like illusion. He says like, he gave me actually an example and I said that that's pretty cool. You know, like you actually gave me an example. Another thing, you know, like uh, I, you know, like how I works. I would maybe add, 
I wouldn't rods really, and cones and realize yeah I, I would just say rods and cones I would say there are cones yeah. there are rods uh, they work differently cones you know they we use them during the day rods we use them during the night that's the background of why we have different vision so it, it, it's kind of like it, it's connected with with the eye design you know I actually like <laughs> and I, I, I would I would give a guy like a, a few advices when flying at night let your eye adjust, red color. And you know, if she goes deep, like why is it the red color then, you know, good luck <laughs> explaining like different like wavelengths. But I, I don't think she's gonna do that. But I would say, you know, like it, 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 it's, it's uh, specific with eye design. There are rods, there are yeah. cones. I'm not gonna go into that, how many cones, how many rods, where, are, where they are. I just wanna tell you that they work differently and that's why we actually see differently and that's why we scan differently during the night. So it, 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 it's with the evolution, it's with biology, but I just want to give you a background. It's not magical, it's not so, I just want you to know that. So that, that's maybe the one thing that, that I would maybe yeah. add really quick, you know. I, I think, you know, it, it's, I think that's a really good point, Ivan. I totally glossed over vestibular illusions because I thought to myself as I'm, you know, teaching this lesson, well, you know, so many of these really aren't that relevant to a visual pilot. They're very relevant to a, an instrument pilot, but not to a visual pilot. Well, it still says in the PTS we have to cover them. Feel like you could go 20 minutes into vestibular illusions super easily oh, yeah. going 20 minutes in and so i think that i probably shortchanged it by not at least mentioning um like an elevator illusion um the leans i i don't think you need to go into like graveyard spin spiral um you know i don't think you know some some photographic uh illusion i think is probably another maybe important one to mention but I think that, you know, what I would do if, if I were to criticize myself, um, I would mention maybe two or three specifically and just say, be aware that your brain, your eyes, your ears all play tricks on you. Um, and it's important to realize the tricks that they play on you. Um, but, in, and then kind of say, you know, maybe in a separate lesson, maybe, you know, if you're interested, let's go deeper into this. I want you to do ground on this, but man, this is where I, I think it's really hard in a lesson without like Q and A, like, Hey, you know, um, uh, a student, uh, did you read the, uh, the P hack last night? Uh, like I told you to, and do you have any questions on the vestibular illusions? So, yeah, in a lecture method, um, I prob I I would definitely specifically mention two or three and say there are more. Let me assign you some reading. Right. Yeah, it's, it's maybe just to like point them out, but I, you know, they are definitely like you're saying. You know, like it's a private pilot level. You know, I would say that. Uh, more, you know, the visual illusions, especially for us as a private pilots, definitely, you know, and, and, and we can talk from our own personal experiences, you know, as long as we, uh, how, what percentage are we getting from, from, from the eyes? 80, how many percent? Three or 88? Uh, it's, I don't remember Over what it 80, is. Off doesn't it's, Between it's, 80 yeah, it's like, it's Let's like, yeah, it's like 85. 85%. So I, 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 yeah, like that, that, that's, that's another thing that I would say, you know, I would say, you know what, like we're getting s s uh, like a really good input a good from point. our eyes and, 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 you know, like as, as long as we can see, you know, uh, maybe like even on a roller coaster, you remember when you were looking outside, the coaster was spinning, but you still know, knew where you were just because eyes are like such a powerful scanning tool that you know, no, regardless how many times you knew when it was up and down, but close your eyes, in a second, you're not gonna know if you're up and down. So I would say, you know, like th those kind of vestibular illusions are more connected with the absence of a good actually input that we are getting from our eyes. And, and, then, and then we get that kind of confliction, but that's basically you said that, but I would maybe emphasize, you know, like, because what you did is, you know, you actually gave, and, and, and this is actually a, a, 
a, a good, like a every feedback is positive, but this is like what I really like. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned Catalina, you, you gave like, you gave those kind of like examples. And, and, and from my experience, th that's where you actually like as a private pilot, you're struggling the most. Catalina, yeah. Brownfield, uh, Vane and John Vane International. Th those are the ones, you know, that, so I, that, that's why I said you, you were actually to the point and I got the point. So just maybe do like a few more like sentences for legal purposes so she can say, yeah. Yeah. you know, like she's, she's, he said it <laughs> and you yeah. know, like he said it. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. You're and, um, right. and also, yeah, like I really liked, um, yeah. So you have a lot of, uh, and, and that's a good thing. And I started, uh, actually uh, uh not really copying that but actually i started more integrating that in my studies because it actually does say that any lecture is supposed to uh, have uh, examples and a very relative uh, airspace uh, local examples right so yeah. you know you you did mention alpine you did mention a few local places uh, the accident over there in Compton, that's, that's local, right? So I, I, I'm actually happy that you kept it local, you know, because we, we have those kind of like really good local examples. So, and uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. For example, for me personally, like when they closed, uh, I, I may have thought that Zach or something, when they closed Montgomery Field, I was on the 45 and the guy took off made a crosswing and turned downwing 492 to Delta without communicating. And the only way I saw him was when he was actually like three, 400 feet AGL. And then I was able yeah. to pick him up with the ADSB and he actually, we converged like so. Even though I was talking on the radio, on the, I'm on the 45, I'm on the 45. The guy took off and he's doing like pattern work. I couldn't see him and I can show you like uh, from my track, I did a hard like right 360 and I saw him yeah. like converging on me. What like, you know, I mean, that's an example I'm actually going to give because like, <laughs> it's going to be very hard to forget. So yeah, you gave those kind of examples and maybe, maybe I would add, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned, uh, the practice area, you mentioned all kinds of like high risk areas where we are doing and you, 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 you did like that kind of like a good practice procedure. I would uh, also add, uh, which kind of like goes without saying, but in this case, I think it should be said because this is a private pilot. I would say, I would actually go back to what we always say that every flight begins on the ground, right? So. I, I would maybe uh, add a few points where, where there are actually really good things that you can get yourself prepared on the ground, such as, you know, the example that you mentioned, you, br you brought, uh, uh, you, you're, uh, you're very hesitant flying with some uh, planes that have damaged front windshield. I would maybe say like, uh, mm -hmm. if you wanna prepare yourself, if you, if you wanna find like a windshield cleaner, uh, Prepare yourself if you're a, with a passenger, let your passenger know that uh, you're definitely looking forward to any kind of uh, 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 input that a passenger may have when it comes to like looking for traffic. A student can prepare themselves uh, by, you know, studying, being very familiar with the airspace, being very familiar with the practice area, being familiar with uh, call, uh, making uh, proper radio calls. So I would just, you know, like, say say whatever you know comes to my mind but i would say you know like prepare yourself how are you a smoker are you hungry are you getting enough oxygen to your eyes do you have some medical conditions i can show you my flight bag i have a, i have I'm, i have to wear contacts and unfortunately as someone who is short-sighted i'm kind of like peeking into other people's bag i noticed that the short-sighted people do not have a spare set of eyeglasses you know, like, let's start from there, you know, like, I, well, you know, like, I, I even have a spare set of glasses in my car, you know, like, what, you know, like, so, you know, like, uh, that's, 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 you know, like, I'm very critical about that when, when I see that someone, like, does, doesn't wear a spare mm -hmm. set. So, you know, like, I would just maybe, like, add, like, what you did, you've wrapped it all up, 
you concluded and, and maybe just like that, you know, every flight begins on the ground. So there are things that you can actually do. Check the weather, yeah. right? Can we check the weather? Is it, is it uh, like uh, you said, you know, that there is a haze, there is uh, all kinds of like obscurations. Uh, how familiar we, are you with those local weather phenomena? Like you said, you know, mm -hmm. we, are, we are on the 2-8, basically the sun is setting. So yeah, like uh, you, you, I think you really like I'm maybe talking too much, but I really liked your lecture. So my my uh, two add-ons and one point. One point is I got the point. Very smooth, you know, like a really good flow, not boring at all. Really good examples, uh, not dwelling too much on on specifics. And like after this lesson, I can say, okay, I get the point. This is a big deal. So I think, I think if you get that to your student and student is like, okay, like I remember some stuff, I half, half I do, half I don't, but this is a big deal. I was, what's learning, you know, learning is a change of behavior. So like, I'm like, wow, you know, like I'm definitely like paying more attention to that. So I, I can say that I learned and I would just like say, cover yourself legally with that boring stuff, specifically, biology of the eye, vestibular illusions, and, and may or may not be necessary, but maybe like a few uh, additional tips. A really good one was like, you use your devices, you know, use your devices. Yeah. I wasn't allowed as a private pilot for navigational purposes. I, I, would, I, I would maybe give that a disclaimer as well. You That's know? a good ad. Yeah, right? I like, mean, I using devices. A, yeah, like use your devices, but I would give a disclaimer, you know, like, hey, you know what, like for navigational purposes, you know, I'm definitely not, not going to try to like make you over rely on technology. However, yeah, like disclaimer, however, it's a really cool thing. So yes, right. you know, like you will know, but disclaimer, yep. you are yep. going to be looking outside. For me, yep. the only thing you know, that I, I would... For me, the only thing that I would really add, but it's mostly just from your style off the cuff right now, and we're all extremely biased since we're all pilots already, but your audience was a little inconsistent, right? We, we kind of started positioning this towards yeah. the student pilot, <laughs> and then there was a little bit of assumed 100%. knowledge. Yep. So, but, you know, that's just being, you know. 100% yep. uh, agree. Obviously, it's different when you just have a, an audience of just students that are clueless and you can see it. So, uh, and then beyond yeah, that, you know, right. I, I just... got out of, I got out of character <laughs> several times. Yeah. <laughs> Although I enjoyed it though, because to Ivan's point, you did have really good tiebacks to your experiences like uh, Harris Ranch. Yeah, I get it. Catalina. Yep. Okay. You know, really good stories to like articulate it. But for me, I was like, well, I've never, I mean, I know Harris Ranch's runway. Like, I've never been there, but obviously I've, like, read yeah. up on there, everything. Yeah. So, and then beyond that, um, you know, obviously, if this was a formal lecture or lesson that was well prepared, you'd probably have more specific examples in the areas like speed differential and, like, what was it, collision risk. You know, I think it the risk could be really well um, articulated by, you know, examples like there wouldn't be a inherent movement if there was a plane coming towards you yeah. which really just adds to that um i don't know fear factor of it but other than that yeah. no i mean you actually hit the points for you hit all the pts points on it for just rolling when rolling into it i think the you know it, what what was interesting is you know kind of BSing. i i had a little bit put together um but not done by any means um I think what is kind of alarming is I just went through the PTS in the order that it's presented, but yeah. in the middle of talking, I was like, that doesn't make sense right here. I wish I would have like, yeah, I don't know if you guys picked up on it. I kind of try to BS over it, but um, the, the order of the PTS is, as you guys know very well, you don't have to present the lesson in that order. Um, right. And in fact, many examples, it doesn't make sense to present it in that order. And I think this was an excellent example. I forgot, but it happened a couple times in the lesson. I was like, wow, that should be the opposite way. So. Yeah. yeah I, I thought, I thought you did a nice job. I mean, um, other than like, some of the ice flag stuff, I guess, like, yeah, uh, it is what it is. 
the examples were really good. I agree with what the other guys said about having hometown examples. Um, in fact, the Compton example is, is the one that I planned on using. There's also the um, collision that happened at Brown a couple of years ago with that Sabre liner in the 172. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad you mentioned the scratchy windshield because that drives me crazy and I can't count the number of times I've been flying around and there's like a bug splatter and I, I freak out for a second and I'm like, oh shit, like what is that? And it's, oh, it's just, it's a dirty ass windshield. Maybe you should have cleaned the windshield. Before <laughs> yeah. you went. So um, yeah. I tried to get better at that, but uh, the integrated flight instruction, that was a nice bonus there where you kind of tied. Yeah. Um, good plug. Yeah, a good plug for that. Uh, the speed and collision risk might help to say like, you could slow down, like if, if ATC is calling traffic and that they're not talking to and uh, the slower you go, maybe the more maneuverable it is and, and yeah. the better chance you have of, of turning to avert. Uh, I think you mentioned it, like greatest collision risk is nice, beautiful day where all the weekend warriors are, are flying and, and, you know, you have a greater chance of them not being vigilant pilots. The people that fly once every three months, they're probably not really paying attention. It's a nice, beautiful day over the coast. And so you really have to be vigilant on those beautiful days as well. Um, yeah, I thought you did a good job. The, Ivan mentioned, I think, using your passengers, and you might have mentioned it as well as an extra set of eyes in your safety briefing. So I don't know, think hey, I did. I uh, well, it might be worth mentioning, you know, like yeah, if something definitely. looks out of the ordinary, if something's kind of freaking you out or, or looks out of place with another aircraft, please speak up because um, don't assume that I see it or don't assume yep. that what you see is normal. It might be. I might hear, you know, ATC calling and I see it. So let's all talk to each other and, you know, point, oh, do you see this guy? Or I see this traffic over here. It's, you know, facts or whatever the case may be. But get your passengers involved and it also tends to, give them something to do and, and maybe yeah. distract you a little bit less, but uh, yeah, I, th I thought you did a good job. I mean, especially for a last minute lesson, you seem to cover pretty much everything. So I don't really have much negative to say. Yeah. Thanks. I think you are getting like uh, too much positive feedback. Uh, I'm going to be like, uh, I'm not sure if I'm, we are doing you a favor, but but you know it is it is true what they say. You know, like uh, uh, the, the 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 way that you're lecturing is uh, captivating. It's uh, it's actually um, connected, I think, with personality. You know, with your background, with overall you know like intelligence of of the lecture. And and I have a feeling, you know, like if if I were if I were the examiner, I would definitely. Uh, look forward to that kind of uh, lectures because you know like me you know graduating law school I was like bored out of my mind you know like for 90% for of the lectures you know it's it's actually really sad you know like because those guys were yeah. actually like I went to like a really good school and they were like top top in their area but like what what's the point you know like you're you're like a state secretary you can't teach like a basic you know like a contract you know, uh, so, you know, I would definitely like look for that. And I think it gives you like a lot of, uh, a lot of credit, but you know, on, 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 the, on, the, on the check ride, maybe the best advice that I, I would give uh, is uh, I wouldn't change the, the, the pace. I wouldn't change the length. I would just be really like sure that I covered everything thing so I, I don't get into those kind of like questions yeah but yeah be, for the examiner you know like I, I would cover you know I would give an examiner a chance to see you know like I, I you know like be like okay you know like I like this guy and I, I would kind of like just give he give him a chance to like <laughs> scratch you know like <laughs> so 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 they can like cover themselves you know like <laughs> yeah who's next that's, no that's good feedback 